Well, questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, last night I was at an event in London discussing the benefits of UK aid with Bill Gates. I have no idea what Mr Gates sta where he stands on our constitutional future, but here's what he said about the United Kingdom aid effort. He said, you are the reason that malaria deaths are down in entire villages and life-saving vaccines are now reaching kids in the most remote parts of the world. Presenting officer, we're about to fight a general election campaign where we know what the SNP's message will be. It will be that living in the UK under a Conservative government will be hell on earth. Given the work that this country does around the world, given the conditions that people face in other parts of the world, can I ask the First Minister, at the start of this campaign, does she really think that's a fair description of life in this country? First Minister. Well, can, I, can I first of all say that, like Ruth Davidson, I support wholeheartedly the commitment to spend 0.7% of GDP helping the world's poorest communities. That's something the SNP argued for long before it was ever a Tory commitment. I did hear Bill Gates uh, comment last night. I heard him in a number of interviews and I also heard him express concern as others have expressed that the Tory manifesto at the forthcoming election will drop the commitment to 0.7%. So I welcome Ruth Davidson's commitment, uh, but will she assure the Chamber today that it will be in the Tory manifesto, the UK Tory manifesto, for the next election? Because no Tory UK minister has yet been willing to give that commitment. Uh, but on to the wider issue of the election. I think the key issue at this election is who is going to stand up for Scotland against an increasingly hardline Tory government. The Prime Minister herself has made it very clear that in this election her objective is to crush dissent so that she can do whatever she wants. So people across Scotland have got to be clear. There is no safe, tactical Tory vote at this election. We've seen the damage that Tories do with a small majority. I know they don't want to hear it, but with a small majority, the Tories have cut Scotland's budget. They've imposed the bedroom tax, the rate clause, cuts in disabled support, robbed women of their pension entitlement. So let's think about the damage a Tory government could do with a bigger majority. So yes, if the thought of a one-party Tory stranglehold at Westminster does horrify you. If you want effective opposition in Scotland, then that can only come from the SNP. Ruth Davidson. <laughs> Presiding Officer Theresa May herself gave the commitment to the aid budget when she was in East Kilbride at Diffid's headquarters, where the aid is administered all around the world. But let's get back. Let's get back to the SNP's contribution. Hell on earth, eternal damnation in a bottomless pit. Direct quotes from her backbencher, Joan McAlpine, writing about life in the UK in a national newspaper this week. So on the one hand, we've got people like Bill Gates, who are talking about the brilliant work that his foundation is doing alongside British aid workers, about the summit his wife is hosting this summer with the UK government, in support of millions more women and girls to get them access to contraception. And on the other, we have Nicola Sturgeon's colleagues writing offensive and negative trash about our country. So who does the First Minister stand with? Is it Bill Gates or is it Joe McAlpine? First Minister. I have to say uh, a number of things to that. Firstly, uh, Ruth Davidson says Theresa May has given the commitment. Well, Theresa May was on radio the morning after she called the general election and she was challenged to commit to the 0.7% commitment being in the manifesto and she wouldn't do it. She was challenged to do something else as well. She was challenged to say that the Tories would have a commitment to the triple lock on pensions in the manifesto and she wouldn't do that either. So I think we should look very closely at the commitments the Tories make and also at the commitments the Tories do not make at this election. But let me say this secondly. 
I support the work that DFID does around the world. I'm proud of the work this government does in Malawi and other countries around the world as well, helping women to get contraception as many as well as many other things. But do you know what I find utterly abhorrent? That as DFID do things like that overseas, at home, this Tory government is forcing women to prove yeah. that they have been raped yeah. before they get access to benefits for their children. So I, I'll give, I'll give Ruth Davidson a chance to do today what she has shamefully so far refused today. Do not pass the buck. Stand up here today and tell this chamber, tell Scotland straight, do you support the rape clause in principle or do you, like me, think it is utterly abhorrent? Answer the question. Ruth Davidson. I'll answer the question the same way I answered it in the press this morning. If the First Minister doesn't like the two-child tax policy, she can change it. But the truth is, the truth is, this First Minister is always happier, always Order. happier complaining Order. about the UK government than she is about doing anything herself. And the fact is, presiding officer, that the way the SNP is readying itself to pour negativity on this country at this election is shameful. And she might not like it. She might not like it, but Scotland is part of this United Kingdom. And if the First Minister really wants to set out her stall at this election, isn't a practical vision of how she's governing Scotland the very least that we should all expect? Or given the way that education and the economy are going, is she just banking on the fact that Scots just won't buy it? First Minister. Well, can I say this? Shame. Shame on Ruth Davidson. And shame on the Conservatives. We have just seen in this chamber the true colours of Ruth Davidson and the Conservatives. Yeah, yeah. Given the opportunity to stand up clearly and join others in this chamber and say that the rape clause, a clause that forces a woman to prove that she has been raped before claiming benefits for her children is morally and in principle wrong, Ruth Davidson refuses to do so. That is utterly shameful. And I think it brings into sharp focus presiding officer, it brings into sharp focus the key issue at the heart of this general election. And I ask people to think about this. The rape clause has been introduced by a Tory government at Westminster with a tiny majority. If that's what a Tory government can do with a tiny majority, let's just think of the damage a Tory government, an unfettered, out of control Tory government can do with a bigger majority. So if people in Scotland want protection against a Tory government, if people in Scotland want an effective, strong opposition to a Tory government, they won't get it from unelectable Labour, they won't get it from the Lib Dems who still say they'd support a Tory government, they'll only get it from the SNP and Scotland needs protection from the Tories. Presiding officer, in the weeks ahead, these benches will set out our vision of a United Kingdom that's a force for good in the world. And we will stand up. We will stand up for Scotland's decision to stay in the United Kingdom. And we will say no to a second referendum so that Scotland can get on with building better schools and better public services. But what about the SNP's plans? The First Minister's very first intervention in this election has been to say that she'd put Jeremy Corbyn in number 10. Now, is this because, is it because uniquely the First Minister sees in Mr Corbyn the wisdom and the foresight and the leadership skills that are needed in a Prime Minister? Or could it possibly be because, in his own words, Jeremy Corbyn is absolutely fine with another referendum on independence. Is that the alliance that she's really seeking when she was down in London? First Minister. This is pretty tired stuff from the Tories. Uh, you only have to take one look at the polls to know that Jeremy Corbyn ain't going anywhere near number 10 <laughs> Downing Street on his own or with the help of anybody else. And that brings us back, that brings us back to the core issue, presiding officer because of the unelectability of Labour. Scotland faces the prospect of an unfettered, 
out of control Tory government, and we know the damage that can do to Scotland, to our budget, to the vulnerable, to pensions, to our economy. So that's the choice for Scotland. Vote SNP to make sure that Scotland's voice is heard and that Scotland has protection against the Tories. Because the problem for Ruth Davidson, as she has so clearly set out today, Scotland knows the Tory vision for Scotland, the rape clause, penalising the vulnerable, taking, taking motability vehicles away from disabled people. People across Scotland know the vision and the programme of the Tories and that is why people in Scotland know that if they want protection against that Tory vision they must vote SNP. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. In recent weeks, the First Minister has joined me in calling out the Tories on the horrific rape clause. She has accused Theresa May of seeking to undermine devolution. And she has said that the Tories are taking us off a cliff edge with hard Brexit. And she's just told us that we've seen what the damage a Tory government can do. So why did the SNP abstain yesterday instead of voting with Labour to get rid of this Tory government? First Minister. You know, I, I hate to be the one that has to point it out, Kezia Dugdale. It wasn't the SNP that voted with the Tories yesterday in the House of Commons. It was Labour who tripped through the lobbies with the Tories yesterday. You know the lobby, I mean, it's that one that had turkeys and Christmas written <laughs> above it. The idea in this election that Labour is going to replace the Tories is frankly pie in the sky. The issue and the threat at this election is that due to Labour's complete unelectability, we face an unfettered, out of control Tory government. We know that the Prime Minister wants to silence opposition. So the question for Scotland is this, if you want a strong opposition to the Tories, if you want MPs who will stand up and be a voice for Scotland, then the only party to support at this election is this one, the SNP. Labour MPs voted yesterday to get rid of this miserable Tory government. And imagine my surprise, imagine my surprise, imagine my surprise that the SNP MPs didn't do the same. The First Minister has said, the First Minister has said that she wants an honest debate. So let's have it. It suits the SNP for the Tories to stay in power. That's why they refused to vote Theresa May out of office yesterday. And every day that the Tories remain in power, 430,000 Scots go without a real living wage. Waspy women go without the pension they have worked their whole lives for. And young people have their housing benefit stripped away from them. It suits the SNP for the Tories to stay in power. Because the only thing the SNP have ever cared about is independence. So tell us, First Minister, on the 8th of June, what's more important? kicking the Tories out of office or having another divisive referendum? First Minister. Well, presiding officer, Jeremy Corbyn is unelectable and will leave Labour carping from the sidelines. How do we know that? Because that's what Kezia Dugdale said about Jeremy Corbyn. So do you know, I agree with Kezia Dugdale about how awful and how damaging this Tory government is. That's why I think it is so utterly shameful and disgraceful that Labour have allowed itself to get in the position that this law are 20 points ahead of them in the opinion polls UK-wide and are even ahead of them uh, in Scotland as well. That's Labour's failure and it is an utter disgrace. But it brings us back to the core point at stake in this election. The only thing in this election standing between an out-of-control, unfettered Tory government and Scotland is the SNP. So if people want to make sure 
that the Tory government can be held to account if they want to make sure there is a strong voice for Scotland and if they want to make sure Scotland is protected against exactly the kind of policies that Kezia Dugdale talks about, they have to make sure they send SNP MPs back to Westminster. Kezia Dugdale. Officer, it was the First Minister in 2015 who told Scotland, vote SNP to keep the Tories out. That How's that going? going? How's that going? How's and that can going? I say to her in all seriousness, if we set MPs, say to her in all seriousness, nothing, if, Jeremy Corbyn, if Jeremy Corbyn was Prime Minister, there would be no rape clause. There would be no more housing benefit cuts and there would be no more austerity. And I will proudly campaign for that over the next six weeks as she campaigns for independence. Right. And can I say, the last time we voted in a general election, Nicola Sturgeon said this, I have made it very clear that if you vote SNP in this election, that is not a vote for independence, nor is it a vote for another referendum. Time and time again, we were told that a vote for the SNP is not a vote for another referendum. So will the First Minister have the decency to tell the voters before they vote that she will use this election as another excuse for a divisive referendum? Or once again, will she wait until the day after? First Minister. The mandate for another referendum was sought and won at the Scottish Parliament elections last year. This election... This election is about who will stand up for Scotland against the Tories. It's about who will stop the Tories silencing and crushing the opposition. Kezia Dugdale has got the nerve to stand up and somehow blame the SNP for the fact that the uh, Tories didn't lose the election in 20. I am almost speechless that the <laughs> SNP is to blame for the fact that the uh, Tories won the election in 2015. It was Labour's fault. If Labour had won every seat in Scotland, they would still have lost to the Tories across the UK. Labour are unelectable and utterly useless. That is the tragedy of UK politics right now. So it brings us back to the central point. The only thing in this election, and I would, I would ask everybody, every voter out there to think about this seriously. The Tories want people to think there's some safe, tactical Tory vote that they can cast in this election. But every single Tory vote cast in Scotland will help Theresa May make sure that she has the ability to do whatever she wants. If you don't want an out of control Tory government, if you want protection, if you want a strong opposition and a strong voice against the Tories, then you have to make sure you vote SNP in Scotland. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Uh, the SNP's Deputy Leader Angus Robertson struggled to explain his party's Europe policy on the radio yesterday. Five times he was asked what policy would be in the manifesto for the general election. Five times asked, five times he wasn't able to answer. He became so desperate, he even asked all the listeners to write in with suggestions. <laughs> it was answers on a postcard. So the First Minister has a chance to influence this. Does she want full membership of the European Union in the SNP manifesto? First Minister. The policy of the SNP on Europe is absolutely clear. We want Scotland to remain... We want Scotland to remain members of the European Union. I don't think there is anybody who could have missed that over the past few months. But, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? Because Willie Rennie somehow tries to criticise me when I've said that, yes, I want Scotland and the UK to remain in the EU, but I think what's really important is that we prioritise membership of the single market. It's interesting that he criticises me for that because it's what Tim Farron, his own leader, says. He wants uh, the UK to stay in the European single market. Uh, the uh, priority is staying in the single market. So there's no doubt about my policy. I want Scotland to remain in the EU. I think the doubt is what on earth the Liberal Democrat policy is on this matter or any other matter. Willie Rennie. Well, if the policy is that clear, why can't she just say it's going to be in the manifesto? Yeah. That would be clear. She's dodging, just like Angus yesterday. The Liberal Democrats, in contrast, are crystal clear. We want Scotland...
Scotland in the heart of the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom in the heart of Europe. The general election is a chance to change the course of the whole of the United Kingdom. The more Liberal Democrat MPs elected, the greater we chance we have of changing the direction of the country. But just like the moment she joined the SNP all these years ago, the First Minister has only ever cared about independence. We know what she and her government are up to. She's trying to get Brexit supporters back on side, so she is going soft on Europe. So it is fair to ask if EU membership will be in the manifesto. So what is the First Minister's answer? Is she going to tell us? First Minister. Let me try it in simpler words. I support membership of the European Union. Surely even Willie Rennie can understand that. But you know, there was another politician dodging questions yesterday, wasn't there? Because I, I saw Tim Farron challenged in the House of Commons by Stuart Macdonald, one of my excellent colleagues uh, in Westminster. And Tim Farron was, challenging, uh, was challenged by Stuart Macdonald to rule out supporting a Tory government, and he refused to do so. So there we have it, presiding officer. <laughs> Labour is unelectable. The Liberal Democrats propped the Tories up for five years and won't rule out doing it again. If you want to have Scotland's voice heard against the Tories, if you want Scotland to be protected against the Tories, if you want a party that stands up against the Tories, then there is only one party that will do that, the SNP. I have a couple of supplementaries. The first from Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. How is the Scottish Government standing up for human rights in the face of Tory attempts to scrap the Human Rights Act? First Minister. Well, we will oppose vigorously any attempts to scrap the Human Rights Act, and we know that if the Tories get their way, that's exactly what they want to do, which makes it all the more ironic that Ruth Davidson is talking about work overseas. One of the worst things that the UK could do and the worst message it could send internationally is to be seen to roll back on human rights, and the SNP will always oppose that and always stand up for human rights. Neil Findlay. Uh, will the First Minister confirm that airport expansion, new flight routes and the scrapping of air passenger duty are all government policy? And does she agree with me that it is rank hypocrisy for MSPs, MPs and government ministers to pretend to their constituents that they oppose these policies when all, all the while they compliantly voted them through in Cabinet? First Minister. Well, I want Scotland to have the best possible uh, connections with the rest of the world because that is good not just for people in Scotland, uh, it's also good for our businesses seeking to expand and to export more overseas. So I make no apology uh, for wanting our aviation connections as well as our other transport connections to be as good as they possibly can be. But I am also very clear about our responsibilities to tackle climate change. Uh, and this government and indeed this parliament should be proud for the world leading action it is taking to tackle climate change as well. Question number four, Marie Todd. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the first minister whether she will provide an update on her visit to the United States. First minister. Uh, yes, I visited the United States between the 2nd and 7th of April, uh, attending events and meetings in California and New York. The vi visit focused on trade and investment, boosting tourism, sharing best practice across the public and private sector, and promoting Scottish innovation, entrepreneurship and culture. Uh, the relationship between Scotland and America is an important one, uh, with deep and long-standing ties reflected by the strong economic, cultural and personal links of our citizens. So this visit was an important opportunity to assure businesses and visitors from the US that Scotland is an outward-looking, welcoming country and remains very open for business. Marie Todd. I thank the First Minister for that answer. I was particularly pleased to see climate action was on high on the agenda with the First Minister signing a climate deal with the Governor of California. In the Highlands and Islands and throughout Scotland, renewables are transforming communities, creating employment and helping us meet our climate targets. 
While the Tories at Westminster trash subsidies for green energy, how can we continue to meet our global obligations to tackling climate change in partnership with allies around the world? First Minister. Well, it is important to stress that Scotland is making uh, huge progress in delivering our climate change ambitions, but we've still got much to achieve. Um, I did meet with the Governor of California in the US to discuss how our two administrations can work together to achieve our shared ambition of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We've pledged to cut emissions by 80% by 2050, uh, and we also discussed the importance of offshore wind in tackling climate change uh, and agreed to share knowledge and best practice in developing this technology. Uh, we've also offered to help the Under Two Coalition, uh, representing over one billion people, to prepare for a major summit in 2018 aimed at persuading national governments to increase their efforts to tackle uh, climate change. But there is no doubt that many of the policies of this uh, current UK government fly in the face uh, of our efforts to tackle climate change. One of the uh, other reasons why it's so important that we continue to have voices in Westminster arguing for the kind of policies that will support us, not hinder us, in meeting these ambitions. Jackson Carlo. Um, I was amused to see the First Minister under a banner describing herself as the Queen of Scots. It's not quite how I hear her described nearer to home. But <laughs> the Speaker of the United States, Paul Ryan, is currently in London and has made clear that the United States Government wishes to come to an expedited trade arrangement with the United Kingdom when we leave the European Union. Can I ask the First Minister, when she was in the United States, what formal discussions she had with the government of the United States about future trade relationships and what assurances she gave to them that the Scottish Government would be doing everything they could to ensure that that early trade deal is arrived at? First Minister. Well, I'm glad uh, Jackson Carlow watched the Women in the World Summit that he mentions because I hope that he also heard during that summit the gasps of horror from the audience, the very large audience that was there listening, when I outlined the rape clause policy that had come into effect, that Jackson Carlaw says I misrepresented it. Well, let me set it out very clearly for the Chamber. The rape clause policy uh, puts an obligation on a woman to prove that she has been raped if she wants to claim tax credits for more than two children. Now, if Jackson Carlaw thinks that's a misrepresentation. I invite him to come to this chamber and tell us exactly what the rape clause policy uh, then entails and to do what uh, Ruth Davidson failed to do and actually uh, have the courage to say that it is morally reprehensible to have such a policy on the statute. But on the issue, I met with a number of businesses uh, and other economic interests in the United States. Uh, I didn't have meetings with the US government. This was a trade and investment focused uh, visit. But in every conversation and visit I had, the message was clear uh, that Scotland remains open for business. And of course, it is all the more important, uh, given the Tories' Brexit obsession, that we get that message out, not just in the United States, but every country across the world. Question number five, Edward Mountain. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the reports of defects found in school buildings. First Minister. Uh, the health, safety and well-being of pupils and staff while at schools is of paramount importance. Uh, following the publication of the independent inquiry into Edinburgh schools construction, the Minister for Local Government wrote to all local authorities highlighting the issues and recommendations that the report raised. The Minister underlined the importance of adhering to building regulations, technical standards and the inspection processes which are in place to protect the public. Uh, the Minister has also written to and met with leaders in the construction industry to ensure that they are aware of the findings and recommendations in the report and to ensure that we can rely on quality workmanship and control processes. Edward Mountain. Thank you. Thank the First Minister for that answer. I mean, I accept that it's local authorities who have the statutory responsibility for school buildings. And the Scottish Government surely, though, has a duty to ensure that those responsibilities were deployed following the publication of the Edinburgh Schools Report. And it is indeed why I raised the safety issues regarding WIC campus with the First Minister on the 26th of January this year, which she chose to sideline. So can the First Minister now explain why it has taken problems in 72 schools across Scotland for the Scottish Government to take this matter seriously? And she will, will she now provide an unequivocal guarantee that all work is being done with local insurance uh, authorities 
to ensure that all buildings, school buildings, are safe across Scotland? First Minister. Well, uh, a number of points. Firstly, I, I note uh, later on in FMQs, Adam Tompkins is going to ask me a question uh, challenging me to leave all responsibilities that are not uh, those of the Scottish Government specifically to local authorities and not to interfere in local authorities' responsibilities. So there is a, a bit of a constituency issue. But I do accept that the Scottish Government has responsibilities. That's why I set out the action that the Scottish Government has taken. And I would say to the member, we didn't wait for the independent report. Uh, we wrote to local authorities in the way I have described uh, shortly after the Oxgang school situation arose last year. So we acted promptly as the public would have expected us to do. I think it's also important uh, to note that none of the schools requiring remedial work were built under this government's current schools programme. Uh, these are historic school building uh, projects. But nevertheless, A, we've got to make sure that all school buildings are safe and that lessons from previous PFI programmes are properly learned uh, and implemented in the future. And the government is absolutely determined that we will discharge our responsibility to do so. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And of course, uh, the schools that are in question were built by Labour and the Liberal Democrats under PFI. And the First Minister will know that North Ayrshire, the Labour-run council, built four new schools a decade ago with construction costs of 81 million. Yet between 2007 and 2037, 401 million will have to be paid in unitary charges to the companies who built them, including 12.7 million this year. That's the equivalent of buying an £81,000 flat, paying a mortgage of £1,114 a month for 30 years, and then not even owning it at the end of those 30 years. Does the First Minister agree that Labour's reckless handling of our public finances whilst in office continues to rob North Ayrshire and much of Scotland of funds which could be used to put towards delivering better local services and that it's high time that Labour apologise for the legacy of incompetence they left our schools, North Ayrshire and local authorities across Scotland? Yeah. First Minister. Uh, well, yes. Yes, I, I do. Uh, but while I think it's fair to point out that the inquiry... It said that the financing method was not in itself responsible for defective construction. It does state, it does state that the implementation of the contract by the partners involved uh, could have been stronger. So questions really must be asked and in due course answered about all PFI contracts that many at the time feared uh, put profits before quality. The cost of Labour's disastrous PFI deals are still today taking significant sums of money away from vital public services. So this government is determined to secure maximum value uh, for money in existing PFI contracts. The Scottish Futures Trust uh, work on behalf of ministers and have done so for some time uh, with public bodies to identify the scope to improve both the efficiency and the performance of these contracts and this uh, work will continue. But I do think uh, this whole episode had raised some serious questions for previous Labour administrations and one day perhaps they will have to answer and yes, apologise. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is an issue which has had a distinct impact on my constituency. Uh, a year ago, the pupils at St Peter's Primary School had to go elsewhere. Liberton High School had to host neighbouring Gracement High School and dozens of families to send their children to Oxgangs live in my constituency. The underlying issue was the failure of contractors to install tie rods in uh, the walls of those school buildings. Uh, a failure that wasn't picked up by building control. And indeed now we learn that there are scores of school buildings across Scotland which similarly have a similar structural uh, faults, again which were failed to be picked up by building control. Clearly there are issues here about the, the, the sign-off procedure, the way building control works, and fundamentally the safety checks. Can the First Minister uh, tell, the, tell Parliament what changes and reviews will be made of the building control process and regime? Well, I think that is a very fair question. I want to respond uh, to two aspects of uh, the member's question. Firstly, uh, to recognise the disruption this caused for pupils uh, across Edinburgh uh, last year. Uh, the report, the independent report, uh, does uh, say that the educational, negative educational impact on children uh, is likely to have been relatively limited, but you know, I don't think that takes away from the disruption and the concern that pupils and parents had last year, uh, particularly for older uh, pupils that would have been needing exams, and I think everybody deeply regrets uh, that. Secondly, the issue about scrutiny of work and uh, building 
and control processes, I also think is one that we have to reflect very carefully uh, on. Uh, we've got to make sure that there is an appropriate level of independent scrutiny uh, of building work. Uh, the government is reviewing all existing guidance on appropriate supervision and contract management uh, so that we can be assured that best practice is available as a matter of course in all construction projects. So these are uh, schools that were not built uh, in the main under this government, but that does not change the fact that as the incumbent government now, we have to make sure that the right lessons are learned and that those lessons are applied in future, and we are absolutely determined that we will do that. Question number six, Claire Baker. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports of sexually exploitative behaviour in the private rented housing sector. First Minister. Uh, well, I was extremely concerned, horrified, uh, actually, to read uh, the reports that the member refers to. And the Minister for Housing has already written to the website concerned uh, that hosted these adverts, asking them to take action. Uh, as a government, we are uh, already taking action to tackle issues like this through the implementation of Equally Safe, which is our strategy to tackle uh, any violence against women and girls. Uh, and we're also taking action, of course, to improve the availability of and access to housing, for everyone in action to tackle poverty and inequality, which can so often render people vulnerable to being exploited in this kind of way. Uh, any person always has the right to refuse to consent to sexual activity and forcing uh, someone in any way to participate in sexual activity uh, is a crime. So we continue to keep all laws under review to ensure that they are fit for purpose in tackling what I think are unacceptable behaviours. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the First Minister for her response and we know that these sex for rent adverts have been posted online for properties in Scotland but we have no way of knowing how many tenants are currently in these arrangements and as the First Minister says the practice does open the door to vulnerable tenants who are often facing homelessness and poverty and are finding themselves in commercially exploitative arrangements. Um, I welcome the First Minister's reports of the action that has been taken by the Housing Minister but can I ask her what action the government will take to ensure that any landlord who are found to be offering such arrangements are properly dealt with. Um, more specifically, what action is being taken through the Equally Safe project? And also, have they had time to have discussions with any groups who are supporting vulnerable women who are seeking accommodation to raise awareness of these exploitative practices? First Minister. Well, let me assure the member that we will look carefully at what uh, action we can take uh, further to what we are already doing across all of these areas. The Minister would be very happy to meet with the member to discuss this in more detail if that would be of interest to her. Uh, she raises particularly uh, the situation of landlords and where landlords are, are behaving unacceptably then, you know, clearly uh, there are provisions to seek to deal with that. I, I suspect in cases like the one she's highlighting, uh, often the problem will be there is no formal tenancy agreement. These are informal arrangements, which doesn't make them any more acceptable, in fact, much less so. But sometimes that will be one of, of the challenges. These are not formal arrangements where there is a recognised or registered landlord. Uh, but nevertheless, these are serious issues. Obviously, there are uh, wider issues uh, involved around uh, this kind of thing. But I will undertake to uh, ensure that the, the Minister considers all of the suggestions made by the Member and uh, the offer of a meeting stands if the Member wishes to take it up. Patrick Harvey. I recognise the First Minister acknowledges that not all of these circumstances will involve a registered landlord, but in order to register, landlords have to comply with a fit and proper person test. Isn't it pretty clear that any such exploitative arrangements should lead to an automatic fail of the fit and proper person test and revocation of any existing landlord registration? First Minister. Uh, I think my simple and straightforward view uh, or answer to that question would be yes. I, I struggle to see how anybody who placed an advert of this description would pass the fit and proper person test. Patrick Harvey and other members indeed, of course, will be aware there is a, a proper statutory and legal process that uh, uh, local authorities have to go through before they can take landlord status away from somebody. And obviously uh, I, I couldn't in any uh, situation preempt that. But I think we're all agreed uh, about the unacceptability of uh, the examples that have been brought to the Chamber's attention. So just as I did uh, with the previous uh, member, I will undertake to discuss this with the relevant Minister to make sure that the Scottish Government is taking whatever appropriate action we are able to take. Question number seven, Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on Reform Scotland's view that local authorities should be responsible for all matters that are not specifically reserved to the Scottish Parliament. First Minister. Well, firstly, maybe the Tories should start practising what they preach occasionally on uh, some of these issues. But uh, local authority responsibilities are very clearly set out 
uh, and the focus of the Scottish Government is on encouraging councils to empower uh, communities across the country because I think it's important that we don't just consider what power local authorities should have but also how local authorities then transfer more of their power to local communities. Uh, that's why our Community Empowerment Act puts additional powers into the hands of communities to hold their own uh, local authority to account and of course we're also discussing with COSLA how to achieve our aim of having at least 1% of council budgets uh, decided in this way, uh, building on the work of our £2 million Community Choices Fund. Adam Tomkin. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Yesterday we published our local government uh, manif election manifesto in which we argued that councils in Scotland should focus on growing their local economies. Cities in England are being given ample new powers to do just that, from the Northern Powerhouse to the Midlands Engine. Can the First Minister identify even a single power that she would devolve from this Parliament to our cities to enable them to do the same? First Minister. Local authorities, of course, already have a power of general competence. There is nothing standing in the way of local authorities uh, already getting on with the job they should be doing, and many are doing well in terms of uh, growing their local economies. Uh, as the member is aware, uh, the government uh, has also promoted and uh, delivered, sometimes in partnership with the UK government, city deals, so that we're not only uh, making sure there is devolved power uh, in the hands of local authorities, but there is substantial additional investment at the disposal of local authorities to do the things that will support economic economic growth. So we will continue to do that. I look forward to seeing many more city deals uh, in the years uh, ahead, not least in uh, this city of Edinburgh and its surrounding areas. Uh, so I am a great believer in giving local authorities uh, the powers and the resources they need uh, to do the job in local communities. But I don't want to see powers uh, stop at local authorities. Real community empowerment is important too, and that's why the Community Empowerment Act is so important. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the uh, Reform Scotland uh, paper. It contains a lot with which Greens uh, agree. Um, we believe that local government should have far greater fiscal autonomy than it does do. And some weeks ago, we published a proposals for a fiscal framework between Scottish government and local government. Does the First Minister agree that just as the Scottish Parliament is getting more fiscal autonomy, and just as the Scottish government has entered a fiscal framework with the UK government, so too should those relationships be mirrored with local government? First Minister. I think there's some merit in that and indeed uh, ahead of the Scottish elections last year we did indicate a willingness to talk to local authorities uh, about what uh, additional tax powers would lie better with them rather than with the Scottish Government. In fact, uh, Scottish local authorities have already uh, got autonomy in terms of uh, the ability to lower business rates, for example, if they think that is one of the things uh, that would help grow their economy. So this is a discussion that uh, the Government is certainly uh, very willing to have. Obviously, we have local government elections in just a couple of uh, weeks' time, and after those elections, with uh, new administrations, uh, uh, hopefully in uh, some parts of the country, that is a discussion uh, that across the political spectrum uh, we can take forward with new administrations and councils the length and breadth of the country. Alec Rowley. Back in 2007, the First Minister said that the council tax was unfair and that no amount of tinkering with the council tax could make it fair. Does she believe today that the council tax is still unfair or has, has the tinkering with the bans made it fairer? First Minister. Well, the rebanding, yes, has made the council tax fairer, but I would say two things, I think, to Labour. Firstly, uh, during the first term of the SNP administration, Labour blocked the abolition of the council tax. So I think it ill behoves them now to stand up here uh, and somehow argue for it. But the second point I would make about the council tax or Labour's position on the council tax, which I think just underlines the hypocrisy sometimes at the heart of their arguments. Uh, Labour published its local government manifesto this week. And in that manifesto, on page six, it says this, the SNP council tax freeze has crippled local government. Now, as well as being complete nonsense, that statement right now is utter hypocrisy. And I'll tell you why it's utter hypocrisy. Because right now in Scotland, there are only eight council administrations proposing a continuation of the council tax freeze. And guess what? Every single one of those eight councils is a Labour-led council. So there you have it. Labour might say one thing in this chamber about the council tax, but their administrations across the country do the complete opposite. Yeah. That concludes First Minister's questions. We move on to members' business in the name of Clare Hockey. We'll just take a few moments to uh, change seats for members to change seats.